in his poem, Next to, of course, God, America, I, E.E. E. Cummings uses the form of a sonnet to satirize the unthinking nationalism that, in part at least, led to the First World War. The poem relies on its unconventional use of capitalization and punctuation, as well as its use of illusion. Ultimately, Cummings, in the way that he uses, for example, enjambment, uh, and essentially creates, uh, if we're to believe the punctuation, a one-sentence, 13-line <laughs> stanza uh, ultimately subverts not only the, it satirizes not only the nationalism that is the content of the poem, but ultimately the form itself, the form of a sonnet as a, uh, as a way to, to, to tell a new truth in a new modernist world. So we notice that the poem starts uh, in quotation marks, and, and we see the end of the quotation marks at the end of line 13. So this whole block of text here is in quotation marks. And it begins with the lowercase uh, n. We can see the, the unconventional uh, capitalization. Next to, of course, God, America, I. These things that should normally be capitalized, the conventions go, are not, right? Which, which uh, starts to suggest uh, a, an irreverent tone towards things like God and country, and ultimately creates a kind of parallel uh, relationship between these three things, uh, in, just in the capitalization. Love you, land of the pilgrims, and so forth. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early my country? Tis of centuries come and go. So here we find uh, two and maybe three um, allusions, muddled allusions to patriotic songs. Um, land of the pilgrims, pride, it should be, and Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light that that is the national anthem and my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, etc. So these, these uh, patriotic songs are kind of like muddled together, um, which, um, you know, the connotations of a national anthem are, are, are obvious uh, in terms of patriotism, but kind of presenting them in this way, as the poem does, uh, also furthers that irreverence that we see Centuries come and go and are no more. What of it should worry in every language? We should worry in every language, even deaf and dumb. Again, this deaf and dumb, these words sort of crammed together. Uh, we get the sense that E.E. E. Cummings is messing with us. What, what would it mean, a language of deaf and dumb? An inability to hear and an inability to speak. Uh, but that, that is important when it comes to uh, Cummings' exploration of the, the individual in relation to the, the, the state Thy sons acclaim your glorious name by glory, by jingo, by gee, by gosh, by gum. Now, uh, proclaim, uh, acclaim your glorious name sounds almost like the language of religion. Again, something high, but it's combined here with something low. By glory, by jingo, by gee, by gosh, by gum. We hear the alliteration. This is actually an allusion to a kind of meaningless pop song that was on the radio in E.E. E. Cummings' day. So what is the effect of combining, let's say, a uh, patriotic songs uh, and the language of religion, acclaim your glorious name, with um, a pop song that's literally meaningless, by gory, by jingo, that, I mean, they, these words don't mean anything. Uh, but jingo does kind of have that other connotation of jingoistic, which is, um, you know, going along with something uh, without really thinking. It has that double resonance. Why talk of beauty? What could be more beaut if full? So this may be the most extreme version of enjambment. We find enjambment throughout, uh, you know, for example, the the... Oh, say can you see from lines two to three. Uh, and then the way that these kind of ideas are crammed together and flow into one another without any kind of punctuation. But here, literally, the poem, uh, the, the, the form is uh, destroying beauty, right? I mean, it's uh, beauty is destroyed by the rhyme scheme, which is the opposite of how a poem... Uh, should work. A poem as an aesthetic text or work of art should be concerned with beauty. Here the form itself um, disrupts that beauty and that makes sense when we think about that form in relation to content uh, where individual lives are disrupted and ruined by uh, political structures meant to, meant in fact, and cl who claim to protect the lives and liberty of that same individual. Beautiful. What could be more beautiful than these heroic happy dead? So the alliteration connects heroic and happy, but heroic and happy in this case um, are not the same. 
Uh, what could be more beautiful than these heroic happy dead who rush like lions to the roaring slaughter? I love this line uh, because we have rushed and roaring. Uh, rushed like lions. It makes sense that the that the um, the soldiers would be compared to lions because lions have strength and lions are ferocious, etc. Uh, but we would expect the lions to be roaring. But here this word roaring modifies slaughter. Roaring goes with slaughter. Um, which, in effect, makes slaughter sentient, almost as if the slaughter uh, were, were uh, personified. The slaughter has agency, right? Um, and again, when we think to World War I with the, with, the kind, with the ways that industrialization influenced weaponry uh, and what that made possible, it is, it is kind of uh, interesting to think that an individual in the face of that, what can bravery look like in the face of industrial weaponry, right? It is, it is the slaughter that is roaring that is somehow bigger. They did not stop to think. They died instead. Then shall the voice of liberty be mute. So around the place in a sonnet where we would expect to turn, we find that somewhat. Why talk of beauty? What could be more beautiful than these heroic happy dead? Um, the speaker asks us to, to um, what could be more beautiful? Uh, these heroic happy dead who rush like lions without thinking. Except that here the poem and E.E. E. Cummings asks us to think, and he does that by putting all this language in quotation marks and giving us a hard pause here. He splits his sonnet into two stanzas, and then we have the final line, he spoke and drank rapidly a glass of water. So who is this he? Um, I think it has to be the, 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 the politician, right, who's using language in this way, who's appealing both to our sense of nationalism and glory and honor and God uh, and religion uh, and also our sense of popular culture. Um, but he's doing that in a very incoherent way by, by splitting this poem into two stanzas like this and giving the line 14 on its own, uh, pulling us outside of the quotation marks. Uh, Cummings creates this sort of meta effect it pulls us out of the piece and it asks us to do what the heroic happy dead did not do and actually stop to think. Uh, and if we do that, we realize why talk of beauty, what could be more beautiful than these heroic happy dead? Well, when I actually stop to picture that image, um, I can think of other things that are more beautiful than those heroic happy dead. So the poem relies on point of view, uh, which, which in this case is far from Cummings. The speaker who's speaking inside the quotation marks is not the same as E.E. E. Cummings. We see that through the incoherence that's created uh, by the jumbling up of illusions as well as the, 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 the ideas crammed together without any meaningful punctuation. Uh, also in the last line, and drank rapidly a glass of water. Somehow there's anxiety in that drank rapidly, almost as if the politician is lying to us. So Cummings is brilliant in borrowing and using a sonnet to convey this message because the sonnet inherits those thematic uh, ideas of unrequited love. In this case, the individual's love of country is unrequited when that country is asking him to do something uh, which which uh, is is unthinkable. In, in fact, um, and to do th in doing this, you know, uh, Cummings exposes the pernicious nature of political language and ideology, which conceals more than it reveals. But he also subverts the form of the sonnet itself as, as in an old form of art that no longer conveys truth in a post-industrial, uh, post-World War I reality.